our second talk, we have Mike Friedman talk about embedded HeGuard diagrams. And if you're on Zoom and have a question, either type it, type it in the chat maybe, or raise your hand and someone's monitoring. Thanks. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and start my career at uh, CMSA. <laughs> uh, so Gigar diagrams are a 100-year-old topic. Uh, uh, all they are is, well, the first thing you should know is if you have a closed three-manifold, that it always is the union of the handle body of genus G leading by some diffeomorphism of a boundary to another handle body of genus G. You can see this, I think the classical way which you take a triangulation and pick it up the one skeleton or and then you would pick up the one skeleton to do a cellulation. You see these two handle bodies fitting together to make the three manifold. Or if you're more a smooth person, you can just say, we'll put a Morse function on it. And the zero and one handles can be the lower handle body, the two and three handles can be the So this is a very basic fact. And every three manifold can then be described by the attaching curves, which determine from the surface the lower and upper handle bodies. So you should use two colors of chalk for the curves. You have a surface <clears throat> and I won't draw the curves, but just schematically, you imagine that if it's genus G, that you should have some G loops, uh, which when filled in, describe the lower handle body, and you should have some other link of G loops in red, which describe the upper handle body. So the three manifold is made by starting with the surface and sort of attaching red handles up and blue handles down. Uh, and for, uh, I'm sure for hundreds of years, hundred hundred years, all the three manifold topologists have pictured it like this, except for the most cerebral, like, like Andrew Cassin, probably never thought of the surface drawn, like in three space, just an abstract surface. There's the embedding of the surface, that is irrelevant to the Hegard diagram, except I'm going to give permission to think of the Hegard diagram as embedded, but we're always doing anyway. I think is a good idea if you're interested, which is the goal of this talk in um, embedding three manifolds into a four space. So I'll explain what an embedded Hegard diagram is just a, a Hegard diagram in which the surface sigma comes with an embedding into S3. This is the extra data. Associated with the word embedding. Well, uh, before I focus on the embedding though, uh, it's a, uh, a central point in the story of Hegar diagrams, that there's a lot of indeterminacy explained how Hegar diagram describes a three manifold. The three manifold is described by many different Hegar diagrams. And this indeterminacy has probably made the tool less useful than it might have been. Uh, the indeterminacy is is a, well one is you can stabilize that is, your surface of genus G, you might have to add additional genus, <clears throat> or you, you would be allowed to add additional genus, and then correspondingly stabilize the blue and red link in some standard way so that the topology of the described manifold doesn't change. So what I've it was an accident here. These these curves should have been more schematic. We don't know 
exactly how red and blue uh, intersect each other. The blue is disjoint from blue and the red is disjoint from red. Those are disjoint closed curves, G of them. But when we stabilize, if we stabilize in this particular way, longitude, meridian, longitude, meridian, then what this, in terms of like Slava's lecture, this is like a, uh, some kind of cubic birth of the graphic going from one more function to a slightly more complicated more function where we have a new two, three handle pair, or, or in this case, one, two handle pair. So this, this doesn't contribute any topology because of the two directions, if you like, one is filled in with the disk, the other is filled in with the disk, the other direction. So this just becomes like a three ball. So that's the notion of stabilization. And the second notion is, well, there's, you can certainly like slide the blue handles over the blue handles, Daniel slides and the handles. Um, you can also do some uh, dang twists around uh, either the red or the blue curves. So this can be summarized saying that um, if you take the mapping class group in genus G, you should divide out by two actions of the handle body subgroup. So let's call it um, uh, handle body group of genus G. There's sort of a, a lower and an upper handle body group. So there's sort of a double coset. You can define it. The gluing in the middle, but then uh, you can change the gluing by uh, reparameterizing the upper hand body and the lower hand body. So that's that's the uh, indeterminacy. So the question I want to focus on is uh, which three manifolds. Those three manifolds. Uh, embedded on R4. Or S4. Or sometimes it's convenient to think of S3 plus R. Just depending on which picture I draw, I'll use one of these. These are a little more problems or some difference. Um, and the reason for being interested in this question is the hope of eventually distinguishing uh, the four sphere or R4 from uh, a fake object. It's a four sphere from a holocopy sphere. Uh, by the way, there's a kind of parallel program which has a long history, which is to try to use the S, uh, the S invariant, Rasmussen S invariant from Kubana homology to distinguish uh, the standard ball from homotopy balls. The thought there is the, the S invariant uh, actually uses the, uh, the product structure, the foliation by of, uh, levels. So if, if you have a standard B4 versus a um, um, sort of a fake B4, uh, it, may, it may be that you can find a, a knot in the boundary of a fake ball that bounds a disk, whereas this knot might be excluded by the S invariant. Might be excluded by the S invariant from bounding the disk and might only bound higher genus surfaces. That, this is a possibility because the definition of Kibana homology uh, does use the product structure. So it's an unrealized possibility, but it's, it's, um, 
There's a paper with Goff, uh, Kevin Walker, uh, Scott Morrison and myself, I think in 2010. And then more recently, uh, maybe 2021, uh, Piccarillo and uh, uh, Cyprian and Westview. In different contexts, use this idea to search for uh, counter examples to point great conjecture via relative embedding problem for services. So I'm just saying an alternative venue is embedding problems of three manifolds. If you're trying to distinguish uh, standard R4 or standard four ball from an exotic four ball, uh, maybe you'll see that uh, they contain different three manifolds. So like, here, let me make that more concrete by giving you an example. Um, <laughs> there's a presentation, I'll just call it P, of the trivial group that has three generators, A, B, C, and three relations, which is A is equal to common integer B and C, and then six cycle is equal to commutator C and A. And C is commutator A and B. So it's it's far from obvious, but this presentation is a presentation of the trivial group. This is one of those presentations that's widely conjectured to not be Andrews Kurtzable. So if you think of so I won't say what this means in group theoretic language, but in topological language, you should think of a presentation as a two complex, uh, in which are three circles in this case for the generators and attached cells according to these rules. And uh, there's a notion of deforming a two complex, which allows you to slide the one cells over the one cells and the two cells over the two cells. And if you'd like, bring into being a little pedal, a new generator and a new relation that just kills that. A generator. So if you think of these deformations in the literature, this is called a, for some reason a three deformation of the, of the presentation. And it's known that any presentation of the trivial group, um, oh, well, I should tell you how this gives rise to a four manifold. You just take the, the complex, the two complex associated with this presentation, and you can include it into R5 by general position, and then take a neighborhood of it. And then take the boundary of that neighborhood. And that gives you uh, that gives you a homotopy uh, four ball of a four sphere. This is a homotopy four sphere. And this is this is the um, the kind of thing that you would like to have some way of studying. Uh, uh, whether it's standard or not, not, I propose one avenue to study it is to ask which closed three manifolds embed in here and hope to find one that does not embed in four space. And what I'm going to use about four space is the level structure. So uh, to explain how I want to use the level structure, let me uh, introduce uh, this little one bit on top. Are any uh, or anyone? Are there any examples where you have a oh. potential counter example they see? Uh, yes. That oh. turns out to be a standard portion. <clears throat> um, yes, I think uh, uh, that is known. <clears throat> Uh, so it's certainly, I think this presentation, A, B, and the relations A, B, A is B, and B, and the relation A to the fourth equals B and the fifth, 
This is the activity converted for um, <clears throat> relation. And the um, if you do this construction, you get the double of the uh, active curvy sphere, which is standard. Yeah, so it's it's not uh, they're not equivalent. But if you find if you find that this boundary is exotic, you've in at once found a counterexample both the Andrews Curtis conjecture and the Simon Curtis conjecture. So I've mentioned several times level sets. So let me concrete. Let me just tell you what ambient more student says. So in the case I'll 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 use it will be I have a three manifold and it'll be embedded in a product, in a particular product. I'm interested in this S3 cross R. And then I'll think of this composition. So I'll think of the embedding followed by the projection on the second factor. This is the function, which is going to be my Morse function. And I can make it Morse easily by simply perturbing the embedding. That's easy because that's a local thing. I just need um, non degenerate quadratic uh, critical points. But the more subtle question or the more subtle fact is that um, you can make this, uh, you can change B by isotopic, no longer, it's no longer just a perturbation, but a large isotopic. Uh, so that E after it's changed followed by projection is ordered worse. So ordered means that um, if you have critical points I and J, if index Y is greater than index of J, it means that uh, function is greater than uh, function applied to the other the other critical point. <clears throat> so uh, you know, so if you think of how you can make an or just an abstract Morse function ordered. It's a general position argument about the ascending and descending manifolds. And this is a similar general position argument. <clears throat> I think the um, easiest thing to picture is let's just imagine we have a surface embedded in um, two sphere cross R. So suppose a little bit of the surface is sitting there as a saddle, which is a critical point of index one. Suppose it's not ordered. Suppose the Morse function has a local minimum that's higher than the saddle point. Well, the idea is you just sort of push the local minimum down, but at some point you may threaten to lose the embedded property by crossing the previous sheet. But if you hit a previous, it looks like you're going to hit a previous sheet, you just run along it until you come to the saddle point, and then you descend lower than the saddle point. So I think if you understand for service in three space, how you can take a local minimum and push it lower than a saddle, pushing it off to the side, then that, that's the essence of all you need to know in order to construct a proof of uh, the ambient force theory. Uh, and being in levels, being three spheres, that's not important. It could be any manifold here. R is important. Um, I should say this is a co-dimensional one embedding, embedding three manifold four. 
if it's co-dimension two or higher, you can actually do exactly what you can do in Fulmore's theory, which is you can change the order heights of the critical points of the same index. You can make those arbitrary. Co-dimension one, we don't have that freedom in the embedded case because saddles can nest. You can think of a whole stack of saddles that are nested on each other and have a definite order of cups, paper cups stacked to each other. Uh, well, uh, why did I bring up uh, ordered Morse theory or ambient Morse theory? Uh, it's because I wanted to use it whenever I think of a three manifold embedded in R4. Uh, this is R4 minus two points. <clears throat> so, So, so what this says, actually, let me draw a spherical picture. So here's S4, and I have some four of the three manifold, M3, embedded in there. I can arrange that I, that meets the equator, S3 plus zero, um, in a Hagar surface for the for the three manifold. Because what is the Hagar surface? It means the lower part is the handle body. It consists only of the handles of index zero and one. And the upper part is the handle body turned upside down and has critical points of index two and three. So achieving the situation where the three manifold is embedded, it's like three manifold, is embedded in S4. Achieving this situation is just an application of this force lemma. I don't know if you want to turn the force here into S3 plus R is so full. And all I do is I um, I rearrange the heights. So that the higher index critical points occur higher in the first. It's not it's not automatic that this surface is a Hagar surface in the three sphere. It's just some embedding in the three sphere. So I'll just point that out that this embeds in S3 plus zero. Um, but it might be not in. And it can be bothered or something. No, it's not in short. Oh, I'm just saying that um, it's not. So, this, this is a handle body down here because it's a handle body up here. You think on the left and the right are just some left and right complements of the, of the sphere, and they might be not handle bodies. So, I'm, I'm happy to live with that. Uh, So if we look at this picture, uh, we can very quickly uh, prove a theorem. So I'll stay here. The theorem is that um, M3, everything is smooth category today. Smoothly embeds in S4, if and only if, M3 has, remember, has this, these are not unique, has the Hegar diagram. A closed surface sigma. So that for some embedding, Of sigma in S3. Um, red and 
blue to my previous notations are zero framed on links. I remember what I think our diagram is. It's two collections of um, G homologically independent curves. Uh, the red ones and the blue ones, two separate collections. And they're abstract on the surface. But once we can uh, the Hagar surface. Oh, sorry. <laughs> once we embed the Hagar surface into S3, uh, then you can talk about the link type of the G component uh, one manifold, which is the red curves, and the link type of the blue curves. And it's actually a frame link because the normal to the surface sigma gives you a frame on the curve. And you see immediately one direction. If the, the manifold is embedded in S3, um, we see from this picture the property that the blue. I'll just call this the blue side. The red side are separately unframed on links, zero frame on links. And that's just the proof is just watch the movie. Uh, you, you, as as um, maybe it's best to watch it going down. So you have surface here and you have G curves, and all you see in the Morse theory is a, a G critical points of index one. You can easily arrange up a single critical point of index zero. So you just see, uh, when you watch the movie, you just see, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have said you, you can arrange, yeah, um, let, let, let's visualize that case first. <clears throat> So we see these uh, blue curves. As you as you uh, as you go down the Morse function, at critical points, you just see these these curves pinching off. These are the descending manifolds. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So the, the first thing that's kind of completely obvious is that the descending manifolds slice the, you know, there are slices for this G component link. But since they don't encounter any other critical points until they um, uh, terminate, uh, there are actually slices whose restricted Morse function has no other critical points. And the framing is easily seen from the local model of the group being born. So, uh, so it's, it's sort of immediate from the ambient Morse theory, uh, one direction, but the other direction is not much harder. Suppose you have an embedded surface and you have these two collections of uh, G curves like this and they're unlinks. Then you, uh, then what, what do you do with an unlink? Well, the only thing you can do with an unlink is you can scan it like this embedded disks, and if these disks never met the uh, surface in their interior, then you could just simply construct the embedding by capping off the red disks to the top and the blue disks to the bottom, you just um, build the embedding ambiently, uh, the way you build the handle bodies, upper lower handle bodies. Well, the, the, we know more than their slice. We know that we're assuming they're the unlink. We're trying to show the other direction that if there's an embedding of the surface that carries red and blue unlinks, from that embedding, I want to from that embedding of the um, of the Hagar surface in the middle level, I want to construct an embedding of the three manifold. And I can construct that embedding merely by pinching these off along the disks that they bound. Well, they bound the disc, they bound the disjoint discs in the three sphere because it's the unlink. Oh, they're standard. Yeah. Oh, it's well, standard. it's the, it's unlink. Unlink. 
but there isn't a little difficulty is that these disks by general position, you can first push them a little to the left or the right. So the intersection with the surface will be some closed circles. There might be some pattern of intersection. And these circles appear to be a bit of a problem because when you pinch off, you won't get um, the correct evolution, which like you're maybe getting an immersion. But you just work with innermost circles. You pinch the innermost circles off, so you end up doing more surgeries than you need to. But these additional surgeries just mean instead of cutting the genus G surface uh, directly into a sphere, instead of surgery into a sphere, it'll surgery into a bunch of spheres because you'll have additional circles of intersection. But these circles of intersection aren't located in any kind of new way on the uh, surface sigma because you've already used up all the space on that surface with G circles. After you take these G circles into account, the rest of the surface is a planar surface. And all these circles either bound to disks in that surface or are um, parallel to combinations of the existing circles. So it's very easy to track the additional embedded spheres that you get when you have you know, uh, additional circles of intersection. So it's a rather elementary, it's completely elementary to go from uh, uh, the embedding using ambient Morse theory to the doubly unlinked property. But the doubly unlinked property with this a little additional argument about innermost circles also gives you, constructs the embedding. So now we have an equivalent condition on three manifold be embeddable in three space. It's that it should have some Hagar diagram. And remember it has lots of Hagar diagrams. It should have some Hagar diagram so that for some embedding, you get double unlinked. Now, this has the flavor of something they call zero infinity problems. You know, it's like the chance of something being the unlink is almost zero. It's like extremely rare. So it makes it seem really hard to, for a three manifold to be embeddable. But now we have all these different um, Hegar diagrams associated to the same three manifold by indeterminacy. And we have all these different ways we might embed a surface into three space. So how do you balance that? Uh, how do you how do you figure out uh, whether this is going to be uh, a, a useful instruction? Well, in order to uh, approach that question, I want to tell you about the very first theorem proved about embedding three manifolds in four space, which was proved in 1937 by a German mathematician. And his theorem is that M3 embeds in S4 implies that the linking form, and I'll tell you what that is on the three manifold, is uh, what I would call hyperbolic. So what this word hyperbolic means in this context is the linking form is some kind of pairing with entries. It's a pairing into Q mod Z. So the entries of this matrix I'm drawing are Q mod Z. And the torsion subgroup of the three manifold, which I'll call tau, the torsion in H1, of M coefficients in C I'll just call this tau for short. It says that tau is a direct sum of two subgroups A and B, and that the linking form is something like that. So, so um <clears throat> Let me uh, show you the proof. Uh, so first, how's the linking form defined? If you have um, you have P and Q belonging to the torsion, then <clears throat> let's say T is the order of the torsion. 
then we can say that um, P is uh, T times P is the boundary of some chain U, and T times Q is the boundary of some two chain V. And then the definition of the linking form P and Q is just one over P of uh, the intersection between U and Q, which is equal minus one over P, the intersection of uh, P and V. That's, that's the usual definition of linking form. But in order to prove Hempstead's theorem, we need a little uh, more algebraic description of the linking form. So, page one of them three, all Z coefficients is isomorphic by point gray duality. Page upper two of N, all we got through. Uh, and the torsion subgroup sits in here. And correspondingly, sitting in here is an X. Now here, here is a hog. So since this is the torsion on both sides, point gray duality creates a natural isomorphism here. And this X term is known also to be natural isomorphic to hog of the torsion in Humansi. So point gray duality restricted to the torsion gives you an isomorphism between the torsion and it's dual, which is another way of saying that there's Mark Ray Duality defines a pairing into Q mod Z, which is non singular. So I think non zero element here is zero. zero. <clears throat> okay, so you, this is um, using, using this uh, definition. We can define if a four manifold, if a three manifold embeds in the four sphere, we can define sort of the A side and the B side, uh, the two sides of the embedding. And I'll let, um, I'll write slightly using notation, I'll write capital A be the kernel on H1, from H1 with three manifold, H1 to A side and B will be the kernel, <clears throat> H1 with three manifold, the G side. Now, I want to show something like this. I want to show that at least you have torsion elements inside A, that taking a, a P and a Q, both in A, I'll get zero. So I want to show this vanishing that I sketched here. I want to show that if P and Q both belong to the same kernel, A, similarly if it was B, then lambda of PQ is zero. So the proof I'm going to show you, I learned from the paper of Gordon and uh, Liviland, but I think it is the original and it's a proof because I think there's only one proof. And the idea is that you define um, what I think, yeah, I, I introduced this before. So let's, let's, um, let's consider let me draw this picture. Here's P. And if I take, uh, and P is in the kernel, so it bounds a thing which I'll just call co boundary into A of P. Okay, this is the thing it bounds on the A side, which is the left here. 
And P, if I multiply it by T, so I go around T times, then it bounds this U out here in the three manifold. So let me get some a cycle by putting a T in front here as well. So I'm going to stick together the COVID, the thing it bounds on the A side, the thing that T times it bounds on the A side together with U, and I get a, a closed cycle minus U. So I'll call that I'll call that um, capital P. This is a two cycle now living in A. And now similarly, I can define another two cycle Q, which would be T times Q. Uh, sorry. Sorry. P is P is um, T times the co-boundary of little p minus u. And q will be p times the co-boundary of q minus v. And the claim is that the intersection of the green theory, the claim is that the intersection, the linking of p and q is one over T squared, capital T dot capital Q. So does this make sense? These are, these are both um, closed integral cycles in A. And this formula is supposed to hold uh, uh, mod T. Once. Module multiples of T, module oh, T. TZ. So the, the, the point is, <clears throat> the point is that this will have to be zero because these cycles that I've constructed, so I'm going to show you why this is in just a second, but to, the way the argument finishes is because this thing they're in, the A side, is sitting inside the four sphere, two closed, uh, two cycles have to have zero integral intersection. So if, if the linking number can be expressed as something to do with an intersection of these two closed cycles, it certainly is, is zero because you're in the four sphere. And the reason that this is true is, is the following picture is <clears throat> suppose I draw that sort of dual picture over here where I take Q, and in Q, and I let it bound, um, you know, it bounds its B, and it bounds its co boundary thing here. Now, it looks kind of complicated because capital P and capital Q are both made from these two pieces, one of which hangs into the four manifold, and one of the pieces is on the boundary three manifold. But in order to compute the general position intersection, you can take one side or the other and just lower it and you know, push it off from the boundary. So when you do that, you know, the picture is slightly easier to see. Lowering the Q side, and you get some intersections over there. Well, the picture actually could involve intersections to the co-boundary. That's possible too. But the point is that these intersections are all multiplied by T squared, because each of these things involves T sheets. So you have T sheets and T sheets. So any intersection of the native co-boundaries and the intersection there translate this algebra to T squared intersections. So that's why I divide by T squared. And because this was, the co-boundary got multiplied by T, According to the original formula, the linking number is computed by the intersection of this bounding thing with the original link component P, but now this has been augmented to P times itself. So this, every individual point here now has T copies. So we have the thing that won't affect the formula is uh, things that have T squared copies because that doesn't change the answer by one. We recover, we recover the linking number by looking at 
um, the V intersect um, the copies of the co-boundary right in the collar where it's, it can be computed uh, from the intersection in the three manifold itself. Moving down into the collar doesn't change anything. So uh, that's um, that's Hans just theorem. Uh, oh, oh, well, let's see. Uh, so uh, just to summarize, so what we found is that we have these two subgroups because these subgroups together uh, span H one of them because all of H one of them is in the kernel is kernel into the four sphere. The four spheres in two pieces. So by Meyer v. Torres, that entire H1 being in the kernel uh, is stand by what dies to the left plus what dies to the right. So these, these span H1, uh, the intersection, A intersect B, better to be just the identity element among, at least among torsion elements, because otherwise, if you're lying in both A, then you're zero intersection with everything in A, and if you're lying in B, you're zero intersection with everything in B. So if you lie in both, you have zero intersection, or zero linking with all torsion elements, because they're linear combinations of A and B, and that would be a singularity of the linking form contradicting on singularity. Well, so we so from this, you know, one deduces the, this hyperbolic form that these A and B are isomorphic, but not naturally. And uh, uh, sometimes this theorem is stated by just saying the torsion is square order, which follows from this. So A and B are isomorphic to each other, and the thing is a torsion is A plus B, but it's, it's richer than that. It's the, the, Linking form is hyperbolic. Okay, the reason I showed you Hanisch's theorem is now I want to relate it to uh, uh, this this theorem and ambient Morse theory. So the so let me make a definition. Let's say that M3, uh, first I'll say two indents. In S4, if there exists an embedded Hedrick diagram with the red and blue being not unlinked, which would be very strong, that's an embedding, two embedding is weaker, being um, ha having linking number zero, each having all their linking number zero. And this includes self-linking. In terms of linking number. And then I generalize this definition to say that we'll say that this um, K embeds, if instead of a link condition on linking numbers, we say that the K fold mu bar invariance vanish. So what we have is we have actual embeddings. And then a bunch, you know, which three manifolds actually embed is a small set, but we have a larger set of manifolds that are potentially larger that um, the two embed. Three embed and so on. So becomes stronger and stronger conditions, okay? And embedding itself is like infinite or something, hence finite order. Sorry. 
Either. Yeah, yeah, so I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying, you think, th think of it in terms of the condition on the links, all these things. So the un being unlinked is a very strong condition and having linking number zero is a relatively weak condition. So we're riffing off the fact that being in a bedding is equivalent, that's what the theorem said, to finding a diagram of the manifold and embedding so that red and blue become unlinks. Now suppose we can't find that, but we can find eager diagram for a manifold such that red and blue under some embedding just become zero frame with linking number zero. Then we call that some kind of weak embedding. We call that a two embedding. A little bit stronger would be if we can get mu bar one, two, three also with image. And we have a whole kind of hierarchy. We can keep going and through all the link invariants anyone's ever thought of and can talk about. As you get closer to the unlink, you have a stronger condition. When you get the unlink, you get the real notion of embedding. So the reason I mention this is we have an enhanced hamster theorem. And what the enhanced theorem says is that this is two embeds. So that's not a geometric condition. That's an algebraic condition in a way. It means that we can find some Hagar diagram, some embedding of the Hagar surface in S3, so that the red and blue separately become a zero frame, uh, zero frame is looking number zero. Point in embedding is just saying, sitting in that same S3. Choose by calling it embedding. I mean, if N3 doesn't actually embed anywhere. In S4, it's just, uh, just it's an algebraic coast of embedding. It's an algebraic condition. And yeah, and, and under varying choices of the diagram and, and, and under invariant embedding. So it, I don't know if it's misleading to call these embeddings, but, but let me just live with that. So I'm saying this weaker condition and the, but a, a kind of a punchline here is that Hanscha, from this point of view, took too strong a hypothesis. He said, if the thinking beds, its linking form is hyperbolic. What I'm saying is true is if it two embeds, its linking form is hyperbolic. You get exactly the same conclusion with this weaker assumption. And the, the proof is almost identical to the proof of Hanscha's theorem. What do you do? Is you draw the following picture. You draw the S3, the middle through sphere in S4. Well, actually, S4 is sort of missing. You should draw a dotted. So I'm, I'm drawing kind of a ghostly image of this picture. I just started with S3 cross I, and then I have the, I have the, uh, Hagar diagram. So here's the uh, here's the surface sigma cross i. And then on sigma attaches the upper hand of body. I I I attach, I take a, I I attach um, the handle body to sigma that's in the core here using the red red circles. Then I attach a lower handle body using the blue circles and thicken them up to get a four manifold. So it's basically what this is. It's sort of a three manifold horizontally, the three sphere. It's some four manifold made by starting with the Haygard surface and um, it's the three manifold made by that diagram, the red and blue diagram that have only the linking number property. So we don't actually see it embedded in the uh, four sphere. We just see this kind of ghostly remnant of the four sphere, but it's enough to do the algebra of Hanister's theorem because the three manifold is partitioning this four manifold with boundary. Four manifold has 
with these four boundary pieces is partitioning the four manifold of boundary into an A side and a B side, analogous to that. With just these two pieces break up into A and B. And similarly, you can define capital A and capital B as the kernels into the A and B side. And you can deduce the same formula that the intersection, that the linking pair in is this one over T squared times an intersection number. And now the question is, before we knew this intersection number vanished because these cycles were floating around in script A inside the four sphere. So you can say, well, what replaces that? What replaces that is these cycles are floating around either in the left or the right half, say the right half script A. We're floating around in here, but this is made by taking a three manifold cross I as the base of the cobordism and then attaching handles. This thickened handle body is equivalent to attaching G uh, two handles. But the key is those two handles have framing zero and no linking. Linking number is vanished, the framing is vanished. And that's enough to say that these cycles, capital P and Q, uh, have no self intersection. There's just no intersection numbers built in this four manifold A. If you start with a product, you attach handles and the linking numbers vanish, you're, you're, you're done. There won't be uh, any intersections in there. So, so what, let, let me just wrap this. What the, what the hope is, <clears throat> is that we can go back to the example I erased with presentation P, the commentators, as well as B, C, and so on. I mean, I, I like this example because this, this presentation looks eerily like the fundamental group of the Borneum rings. Uh, it looks like it has a U bar one, two, three lurking somewhere. So what I propose a good project for Slava and me this week is to find a Hagar decomposition of a homology sphere, homology sphere, three sphere that occurs on the boundary of this presentation. To embed this too complex in four space, you get the homology sphere on the boundary. That's the candidate homology sphere for non embedding in four space. It does embed in a homotopy sphere because you double that. That's uh, uh, that's a homotopy sphere. But if that homotopy sphere, which contains this homology three sphere, that homotopy sphere um, is actually S4, then you can do ambient Morse theory on it. And you can look at the um, uh, Hagar diagram that you would see. And they, and in order to um, be successful in this program, what you'd have to see is that no embedded Hagar diagram, there, there's no way to kill the um, a higher order mu bar invariance for the red and blue curves of that Hagar diagram. That is, <clears throat> so linking number is not enough, uh, but it, it's, it's, it seems possible that if you, consider higher order linking invariance, uh, that the information that the red and blue curves separately, uh, one, one collection or the other has to have uh, non-trivial bar invariance. Um, the hope is that that information survives under the indeterminacy of the situation. And the indeterminacy has these two sources, the double action of the Handle body groups and uh, stabilization. So you, you, you look at a, a, a family of possible Hagar diagrams and uh, you start with one, you know, very concretely, you could take this homology sphere, you can find a Hagar diagram for it, you can embed the Hagar surface and you look and see what kind of new bar invariants are present. Then 
if the thing does embed in forest space, you should be able to use the indeterminacies to kill those mean line variants because you're eventually going to get into a conflict. But if you find that there's some conservation law that you can't kill those move bar invariants, then it means that that homotopy sphere is exotic because it contains a certain homology sphere that uh, can't be three embedded. So where is this conservation? Well, it's just, I mean, it, um, I don't have a good answer. I mean, that, the, the program is to uh, study um, these higher order embedding conditions. Uh, so, anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I think what you're kind of sensing is this program is so far missing, um, like some kind of sophisticated homological machinery to distill the geometric information, like Kavana homology, you know, somehow in floor homology. You know, use um, uh, linear algebra to kind of distill um, uh, the geometry, and you'd have to figure out what's the distilled residue of yeah. the yeah. where the curves. Yeah. Well. <clears throat> Yeah, so it's a, uh, it's really just a program. The program is uh, to switch gears. People can still continue looking at surfaces, but um, for various reasons, I think it, there, it's richer to look at three manifolds rather than the surfaces. Uh, so, uh, and then if you're trying to distinguish standard forest sphere from a homotopy sphere, forest sphere, you know. What is in your hand and what tool do you have? I think it's the Morse function of the critical points. So, uh, you know, this just, you know, sort of comes from following your nose. You know, what do you see? It's the force sphere that you don't see in the atmosphere. But define uh, some irreducible residue of these new bar invariants. That's, that's the trick that some, and probably some oscillation. Any more questions? What's the importance of the union bearing on the bromine ring that you mentioned? So you say it's an exercise. Why do you think you mention this? Uh, well, uh, yeah, so the mu bar invariants uh, kind of move, you know, linking number is a homological thing. Uh, it just like, what does one class represent in the homology of the complement of the other class? That's where linking number comes from. And the mu bar invariants are the nil potent generalization of that. It's like, what does a particular component represent, not in the homology of the complement of the other components, but in a different nil potent quotients. And the Bormian rings is the simplest example where this is realized, where each component, if you think of it as a loop in the complement of the other two, represents the commutator of their two meridians. So that's why it's a little bit like the presentation I wrote down. I mean, it's um, it's not exactly the Borromean rings because in the Borromean rings, it's the longitude of one component that's the commutator of the meridians of the other, and that's why the Borromean ring fundamental group abelianizes to z plus z plus z, whereas the presentation I wrote abelianizes to the trivial group it is the trivial group. So there is some there is some shift of meridian and longitude there, but but it, it's an, but if you have to pick some presentation to look at an example and to try to understand 
how new barn variants come in, that presentation is extremely practical. So that's, that I'm just suggesting that as a starting point to develop the example. Then I have a, with one more question. So suppose I know some three dimensional from a field theory that can detect the warming rings. And actually, I was talking to Cleve many years ago. And I know this precise about the quantum field theory written as a continuum fields. And these are some version of the dark written game theory, which yeah. is the discrete Uncomar detail theory. In fact, it's basically one of the available so quantum field theory realized recently by this uh, quantum computation people they do this uh, four meter in grading yeah. in this uh, deep uh, Hebrew group for the eight. This uh, yes, no, 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 right, so right. if I do this continuum of the quantum field theory, does it help you help in anything to start here? Just like if, if, I, if you convert something in there and uh, you want to start with maybe transform it to it helps, then maybe there's something you can do. I suppose I know precisely some type of uh, indirect, you, you buy indirect dimension. Yeah. If I know the Havali from TKRT, does, does this uh, support anything or any, 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 any problem you would deal with in this talk? Uh, <clears throat> I don't see a connection to okay. TKRT here, but um, I did do a calculation recently, which is on the archive and paper with Matt Hastings, where we compute, um, the, you know, the Bormian rings, <clears throat> The Borromean rings um, gives you a, a state vector in three qubits. If you have, um, if you have a rank two TQFT, like if you have the Fibonacci theory, uh, the Fibonacci theory on a torus is just a single qubit, right? Because there's a trivial particle and a non-trivial particle, and that's it. So you have a rank two theory. And you have a three component link, then the state vector, which is the three manifold complement, lives in the tensor product of these three qubits. And uh, for the Borromean rings, it turns out this is a uh, GHZ state. It's, it's what they call SL or CC equivalent to GHZ. So this is. Um, Stochastic local operators in classical communication, but there's a fairly simple classification of states up to this equivalence relation. There are six, uh, there, there are six classes, and uh, you can figure out that the Bormian rings is in this generic class. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I I think it's example interesting to. To make TQFT computations um, with uh, the links that are your friends and you'll understand them. And it would be very nice if uh, TQFTs were relevant here, but I don't I don't see that at the moment. Yes. And then there um in the book complications on modeling and embedding you got those intersections between the disks and the surface. Okay. I was kind of confused because I thought. You would have the surface cross an interval in the middle, and then the disks would go up and down to be candles. I thought the surface would not propagate up and down. So, why would these intersections come out between the disks and the surface? Um, Uh, yeah, the reason is you're not happy at the end of the day if you've just evolved your genus G surface to embedded sphere because it might be a knotted sphere and you'd have no way to cap off the three manifold. So um, what you really want to do is not just watch the disks as like slice disks, but you want to watch the entire evolution of the upper handle body. So you want to, so the so if you want to, you can think of the upper handle body as made from a, a, a surface sigma cross I with some degenerations happening. 
these two generations can be thought of as attaching uh, handles to the red circles. And then at the end of the day, you get a two sphere, but that two sphere is in then a level. So that, that's why you need to keep the whole surface moving up with you. So you don't just see a link moving in time, but you see a surface evolving in time to get a handle on it. Any more questions? Okay, let's take my figure. Thank you guys for your patience.